This is Long Way to the Top, and I'm your host, Shane Bryan. In the words of the immortal ACDC, it is harder than it looks. These interviews will give you a glimpse into the lives of the artists that we've sung along with, danced and rocked out to. Some go deep into their past and others celebrate their recent releases. But all of them show that regardless of who you are, it's always a long way to the top. The Police were one of the biggest bands of the 80s, a mixture of new wave, punk, rock and reggae. 75 million records, six Grammys, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and in 1983, Rolling Stone called them the biggest band in the world. And then in 1986, The Police were no more. This week, Stuart Copeland releases a book that glimpses into 1976 to 1979, The Starving Years. I'm Shane Bryan and Long Way to the Top presents The Police Diaries. Stuart Copeland, welcome to the show. Voila! How the heck are you? I am fantastic. Thanks for joining us. And uh, sensational book. It's called The Police Diaries. It is out. And I've got to say, I've been absolutely devouring it. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. It It's fun to make it. Uh, You know, I found these diaries which have been sitting in a drawer right over there. They're tiny little books, about that, you know, that big. Uh, So they don't take up much space. But, um, you know, I got a lot of flack with my first book. Because it was kind of like about all the weird stuff that happens when you have already been in a huge rock band, yeah. you know, just the wild things that happen. Um, but that's not the story that people wanted. They wanted to hear how the police all started. So this is that book. You kind of you've you've subtitled it uh, "The Starving Years." Uh, I think is uh, what I, I read. Well, when we got fed, the story got boring. <laughs> uh, you know, well, it got a little repetitive. You know, one stadium looks like another. You know, yeah. but the hungry part, the first couple of years, was when it was the most interesting part of the story. Mm, mm, mm. And uh, look, you know, the, it covers the for those who who. Um, who don't know the start of the police it covers that 1976 through to 1979 uh during the years when you started out uh in curved air as uh, as the drummer yeah prog prog rock well that was the time of the cusp yeah uh where it was all changed um from old wave to new wave from long hair to short hair from uh, flower power to glue power from pot to well from pot to glue <laughs> uh, from peace and love to let's burn it all down yeah uh, all kind of um, you know it was all kind of symbolized by a whole new hairdo mm, mm. that's and exactly my right. two groups of that period curved air and police were on exactly on both sides of that curved air was an og prog rock band we played yes. noodly 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 a lot of triplets <laughs> a lot of a lot of fancy stuff and um we you know it was an old-fashioned record company deal where it was felt like we were the we were the product inside the cans of beans that they were selling and it was just like a, it was all industry yes and then this punk thing came along which was diy mm. you could do it your darn self mm. so i immediately wanted a band they could be independent like that. And I needed a, I I want a three piece band. I need a bass player and a guitarist. One of whom has to sing because I can't, I'm breathing too hard as I'm banging stuff. And I remembered that one night up in Newcastle on a night off with curved air, a local journalist dragged us out to a, uh, the polytechnic there where there was a kind of a jazz band playing or actually pretty good. Hmm. But the first thing I noticed was that bass player. Yeah. He's got his own bass. He can sing, and he's he's got his own amp. Yeah. But the main thing that, that I noticed was this unmistakable celestial glow descending from the heavens <laughs> and alighting upon his magnificent brow. The man had charisma yeah. out to here. Yeah. And uh, and he could and he had his own amp. Yeah. Um. So uh, later, I uh, called that journalist and said, "Hey, can you give me that that." Uh, bass player uh, his number and i started telling him about how this cool scene is happening in london these new clubs are opening up new bands new everything and it's this thing called punk and immediately the temperature dropped like 30 yes. degrees yes. um whoa no you don't i'm not giving you his number said the journalist phil sutcliffe we shall name him yes uh and uh he refused to give me the number because he didn't want me you know like ruining newcastle's finest jazz band yeah by uh punk are you kidding because everybody 
who had a job in the music industry, yeah. for them, punk was the barbarians at the gate. Yeah. Uh, all that is sacred shall be pissed upon. Uh, and so he wouldn't give me the number. Oh, darn. So I hang up and I'm walking around the circle, an urgent circle in my room. And I think, oh, I've got a winning argument, a more persuasive argument, such as, you know, along the lines of, give me his fucking number. <laughs> um, so I called him back. And he didn't pick up. His girlfriend did. Yeah, nice. And she says, "Oh, Stuart Copeland from the from uh, Curved Air. Oh, Phil's such a fan of. Her. Is there anything I can do for you?" Well, as it happens, you know, do you know the number of that bass player? He said, "Oh, Sting. Oh, sure, I'll go get it." And I can hear clip clop away to get there, then click clock away. To oh, here it is. O two seven five three one eight nine four. Is that still his number? Oh, boy, that's still his number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can call him on that number and, and, and tell him Stuart sent you. Uh, and uh, so two minutes later, I hear that voice on the other end, that voice with which we are, that husky voice yes. with which we are all now so familiar. Yes. And uh, the first thing he says is, keep talking. Yeah. And in those two words were a couple of things. Mm. First of all, I called him. Up, hey, I'm uh, my name, I'm in London. I play in this great big band, Curved Air, and we you know, got it all going on. And, I, and I'm building a group, and we're going to conquer the world. It's all great, and you know, with this convincing certitude. Um, and uh, but here's the deal: uh, I'm only interested in you, not your band. I mean, yeah. just are you uh, an individual, or? And he says, "Keep talking." Yeah, nice. And right there, I knew that okay, he's a free agent. Yeah. This could work. Uh, but the other thing was that that was our relationship for the next two years. I had to keep talking. Yes. Yeah, we got a rehearsal coming out. Yeah, we got gigs. We got, you know, okay, we're doing a photo session. It's all going to happen. People, people are really talking about our, I had to, I had to keep the hype going. Talking it up. For, for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, during that period, we didn't have Message in a Bottle mm. or Roxanne. Mm. Every breath, you, none of them. We didn't have anything. We had these crap songs that I wrote, which were just basically bass lines with yelling and um the miracle is that sting didn't run away yeah we you know after that conversation on the phone uh my phone rings and it's him hello hello it's sting <laughs> funny how singers have crap <laughs> they, they do voices. don't they yeah they do uh and i'm downstairs he's he was in a phone booth on the street mm -hmm. outside my flat which long story in the book, we had a two-story Mayfair apartment. Mm. Uh, and, and Mayfair is like the purple, most expensive zones on the British Monopoly board. Yep. What we were doing there, long story, but this apartment was like just with carved furniture, heavy drapes, ethnic exotic stuff climbing the walls. It was like, you know, if, if Vampire Lestat <laughs> had an apartment in London, this is what it would look like, yeah. gothic hardly does justice yeah anyhow he comes up and he looks around wow and uh i said here take this and i hand him a bass and he plug it in and uh we start blazing yeah and this guy's a complete stranger but we are from the first instant locked mm. just oh we rage high into the skies we dig deep under the mountain we go out into the broad expanse of humanity <laughs> we go inside for that little moment of poignancy uh just it's all just the chemistry was immediate and powerful. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's where it all began. The big single that you, you first came up with uh, was released and then reviewed by none other than Mick Jagger. Well, he was doing a stint, a publicity stint at yeah. Melody Maker where he was reviewing this batch of singles. And by the way, this was not of the caliber of any of the songs that Sting would eventually write. This was one of my crap songs. I thought it was pretty uh, good. Which, uh, well, it was okay. Bit punky. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was utility music yeah. to play the punk clubs because that was the only scene happening. We yes. needed punk songs, and I, with my three chords, I concocted a set. Um, and that's the other miracle is that the, I played in my demos of my stuff, and instead of running for the hills, I kept talking. Yeah. Um, and that's what held it together. And so, yeah, Mick Jagger, there's a, there was a picture of him looking at this, this thing. I don't know what his opinion of he, it was, he said, but uh, there he is looking at it. He called the song 
competently played rock with nasal annihilated vocals. Bastard. I'll talk to, I'll have a go at him about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um so we stuck together through mm. thick and well, not thick and thin, through thin and thinner, Sting and I, yeah. as at least we were a hot rhythm section and people would hire us to come and play on sessions. Then we were playing the punk clubs. We did a you know on tour with Cherry Vanilla. We actually were in business. We were playing mm. all these different places. The critics, apart from Mick Jagger, uh, <laughs> immediately spotted us as carpetbaggers because we had obviously were serious musicians. We were five years older than you know Generation X and the Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Damned and all those guys we were just they picked up their instruments yesterday, yes. but they had that panache, that naive panache and energy which gave them all that that charisma. Uh, but we were professionals. Yes. Um, and so we were kind of not getting anywhere. But one day we ran into, you know, we did a session and uh, the guitarist in that section walks in, Andy Summers. And uh, we started out with Henry Padovani, who knew the three chords that I knew and uh, that I taught him. And uh, that was the band. And he was great on stage. Heavy glass. He was Corsican. He had leather jacket, collar up, all the business, you know. We were a great charisma, but he only knew three chords. Uh, somehow Sting survived this lack of, you know, this punk thing. But coming home from that session where we had spent a glorious day playing actual music, mm. we'd forgotten what that was like, uh, playing good music. Mm. And uh, driving home, he He's seething, and he'd, 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 he'd thrown in his lot with this crazy American with his wild, grandiose schemes. And we're driving home, and he's just saying, I can't, we got to get that guy. We, we, we got to get that guy. I mean, Henry, he's just not up to scratch. You know, he just, you're a better guitarist than he is. Then he carries on with his tirade, but I'm, what did you say? R really? Really? Yeah. And whatever he's screaming about, all I can focus on is, wow, what an unexpected accolade. I'm better than anybody you know <laughs> now i loved what you said in the book uh you know and if i can if i can read this little bit out you said and then the guitarist walked in it was the storied alpha session player known as andy summers once again an encounter that changed everything goes unmarked on a diary page in the movie version of this scene there would be angelic music of revelation absolutely <laughs> uh it Changed our life. It changed yeah. the whole everything. And, um, but I, you know, I'm humoring him. We're not going to get this guy. We can't mm. afford this guy. I mean, he, he, there's no way. Mm. Um, but we did play a show with Mike Hallett, whose session it was. Yeah. And by the way, he later released an album called Police Academy, which is those <laughs> sessions. I mean, he woke up 20 years later and said, wait a minute, my solo album, The Police of the, the Police. Band. Yeah. And they're playing like they never played on their own records because it was all chops out to here. It was like musical exploration. It was actually, it really is. It's called Police Academy. Yes. Anyway, so he did a gig in Paris. Andy was at the gig. We got to know him a little bit better. We were playing a show at the Marquee Club in London, and Andy jumps on the stage and burns the house down. Yeah. Um, and we're continuing. Oh, God, I mean, you know, and one day, soon after the Marquee thing, I ran into him at a tube station, Oxford Street Tube, and he pulls me over. Stuart, let's have a coffee. And, uh, you know, you and that bass player, I really think you've got something, but you need me in the band, and I accept. Uh, <laughs> that's our Andy. That's Direct. Nice. Uh, to the point. And I, you know, I, I didn't believe him, and I had to kick the wheels a little bit, so I'm, you know, that, I'm, that's amazing. That's amazing. Sting and I have been talking. I mean, that's, that's I can't believe it. You, you're saying this. Um, but, you know, we haven't got management. I, I'm the management. Yeah. There's no backing. I, I'm the manager. That's it. Me on the phone. Yeah. And we haven't got a, well, we've got a record company, but that too is me with yeah. a letter set doing art myself with glue and bits of paper and, <laughs> and so on. Uh, um, uh, but we do have a road crew. That's you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but he persevered. I mean, he yeah. insisted. You know, he had, I guess he had, he had played with everybody from Neil Sedaka to Soft Machine. Yes. Uh, and um, and he insisted. Yes. So we made it happen. What was he thinking? I have no idea what he was thinking. Henry Padovani. So he was out. He was well, gone. his first mission was to nuke Henry, yeah. which was tough because, you know, he was our best friend. He was the life of the party. 
you know, Sting was, you know, hadn't really emerged yet. I mean, he was an incredible bass player. We had this thing going on, and he was a great front man yelling at the audience and abusing the audience, which they loved, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and he had all that going on, but we weren't going anywhere. As soon as he heard Andy's musical vocabulary, that's when Sting started writing songs. Mm. And, he, you know, as soon after Andy joined, Sting pulls out, you know, uh, Can't Stand Losing You, yeah. Roxanne, Born in the 50s. And every song that he pulls out, because Andy can play what he can write. Yeah. And we had no idea. Sting had no idea what was under the hood. We, he didn't know he could write hits. He was a jazz musician. They played long, involved jazz compositions, you know. Um, but he learned how how hit songs work, how a pop song works. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, mm. something else for the bridge, verse, chorus, out. Very simple. And he learned from playing the cruise ships you know, about pop music. He didn't like it, but he knew mm. how it worked. And the punk scene taught him to, you know, just distilled all of his musicality into the fewest ingredients. But then you add Andy's vocabulary and all that he had learned came together. Yeah. And to his own surprise, he became one heck of a songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Roxanne, the, you know, the big single that was, that was the, the first release, I guess, to, to ah, radio. Second release. Second the release. The first release was Fallout. Yes. On my sorry. Own sorry. Illegal my... Records label, which it was me on the telephone selling boxes <laughs> of records. Uh, you know, I'd call up a record store in Birmingham and, um, I got this record. We're called the police. What are they called? Police. Yeah. That's a bit punkish. Has it got a picture sleeve? Yep. It's got a picture. Is it hostile? Yep. Hostile. Short hair. Yep. Send a box <laughs> because these record because these record stores no nobody was playing this on the radio but the record stores soon discovered it, these wild looking kids would come in there uh, and say where's the punk yes uh, so they had a rack with punk, punk and there were very few records and we were one of the first and we sold a lot of records we made profit enough to go and record another single after that and then an album yeah because, without the record company it was us. You know, the, the money came in. I, the, 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 I was using my brother Miles' offices, which is the only way we could get paid. Yeah. Uh, and we actually were able to make a living from our own crap record. Um, <laughs> but then things started to write real songs, and we started to make real music, and we ended up with a real record company. Yeah. But that didn't even work either. That sank without a trace, too, until... Clark Kent showed up. <laughs> yes, now, now, now I, I do want to get to Clark Kent. One thing, because that, that's a really interesting period of your life. One thing that I, I want to mention first is, Roxanne, you sent that to the, uh, to the BBC. And the BBC said, I'm sorry, it's about prostitutes. We can't put this into our playlist. Who had the brilliant idea to put Banned by the BBC Radio? Uh, oh, that's our brother Miles. Well, all of us. I mean, uh, <laughs> my, the brothers Copeland know how to sell shit, and uh, just because we didn't make their playlist, mm. probably for no reason other they didn't get it, or one reason or another, we didn't make the playlist. Yes. And uh, so immediately for us, banned, banned by the BBC. Thus is how dangerous this group is. And everyone loved it and bought the uh, bought the single. It sank without a trace. Oh, did it? Okay. Um, partly because because we went to Germany to do, in, you know, Andy's mm. last mm. gig that he that he had mm. was as German uh, composer in Germany who was doing a, a tour. And by the way, he needs a drummer too. So Andy and I went over there and soon convinced him that he also needed a bass player. And he kind of liked the idea because it was this show. He had lasers. He had mm. a ballet, jazz, saxophone, and punk group. Yes. Uh, that was us. Uh, he kind of liked the idea. It made him hip and new. Uh, and so over there with, with Everhard, after we'd been playing for a while, playing our crap punk music, Everhard wanted us, no, out, go out. And so we just, without any London critics around us, we could play any darn thing and not get busted as actual real musicians. <laughs> and so in Germany, you know, we're playing there and, and there was this jazz singer and you know, at the first show, we were under rehearsed. We hadn't even rehearsed the whole set. But at one point, the jazz singer does her thing, and we're still trundling along, wondering what we're supposed to do next. Sting walks up to the microphone and starts singing. 
And Andy and I, the hair, we'd never heard him sing before. Mm. We'd only heard him yelling. Mm. And just his voice soaring high like the eagle soars. And every heart in the theater is broken. Actually, we're playing arenas. Of big, mm. And just like Andy and I are going, holy crap, what have we got here? And Sting's just, you know, anyone who's seen a mm. police show back in the day, seeing Sting improvise on stage knows what I'm talking yeah. about. But we didn't know anything about that at the time. And Andy and I come in, and we're playing. All, that's where we discovered our sound, really. Yeah. It was with Eberhard Schoener in Germany. He gave us license to escape the very strict rules of punk. Yes. Anyway, our record, meanwhile, disappeared without a trace. But lo and behold, I had a couple songs which were too dumb, even for the police <laughs> in those days, which I recorded myself. I played all the instruments. I sang and the whole thing, one-man band. Then I made this record called Don't Care, yes. which by some miracle, the BBC Radio 1 did add to the playlist equals hit. Yes. So there I am. And I immediately, you know, with A&M, they had signed the police. It had failed. But I said, look, I'm on the Radio 1 playlist. And they said, OK, OK, OK. And they immediately signed Clark Kent and closed the deal for yes. the police, lock up the police for an album. Yes. Um, and I had a little minor hit and my big brag. I'm glad you somehow managed to drag it out. Of uh, <laughs> I was getting there. <laughs> it was the first time the three blonde heads uh, ever appeared on live national television. Top of the Pops. was Top of the Pops. Yes. Yeah. And national TV. You play Top of the Pops, you go up 10 points in the chart, just like that. Yeah. And uh, so I don't miss an opportunity to remind my two erstwhile colleagues the first time i put you on the map the first time you were you know and the best part of all is we were in masks because nobody knew who clark kent was it was a secret identity and everybody in london the zeitgeist was asking who is clark kent um didn't last long they soon found out it was the yeah. dodgy drummer in that dodgy fake punk band the police and uh but there we were and my buddies were there in masks, gorilla masks, and uh, there was old Stingo playing my bass line, miming <laughs> to my bass <laughs> line and performance as well. Uh, I shall never let him forget it. Of course, he got his revenge, and I ended up, you know, he, you know, <laughs> but I still, I still have that little straw upon which I clutch. Uh, of course, no one could understand what you were singing though, because the mask was just so, you know, there in your face. Well, yeah, I had it was like green paint and cellophane yes. um, cling film. Um, but actually, the BBC wouldn't let me do that. It's oh, it will scare the children, <laughs> you know. And they, we went through everything to try and do uh, You know, I couldn't wear a mask because you can't see the mouth yes. moving. That's no good for miming. Uh, and so I had some some makeup that was supposed to obscure my identity. Yes. Luckily, nobody knew who I was anyway. <laughs> um, but it wasn't long before the damn NME. New Musical Express busted me, and that was it for Clark Kent. And in the nick of time. Yes. Because as you will see in my diaries, I had all my notes of all the stuff that was happening, but I had my other notes, my other yes. writings, you know, my uh, just ranting and raving on the page there. You know, grievance nurturing, grandiose screams, uh, schemes, what have you. And I'm there. I'm having my own hit. I don't need those guys. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Fortunately, Clark Kent disappeared without a trace before I did anything rash. Well, I, I particularly love the line uh, in Don't Care where you, you sing, if you don't like my arrogance, you can suck my socks. Uh, I thought that was yeah, poetic I, brilliance. I had to change that for the BBC performance. <laughs> it's actually out there. You can, you can find it. I've, I've, I think I've got it on my YouTube site. Uh, and you can see Sting's the one. In, you can tell who Sting is right away. Uh, uh, he's the one in the gorilla mask. Andy is wearing a brick. Mejnev mask mm. uh, and the two other guys on drums is my old friend Florian Pilkington Mixa who was my predecessor in Curved Air and Kim Turner who became the police's tour manager. Yeah right and I also believe uh, that there are some demos floating around with Sting actually singing on them. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, in the book, the deluxe version of the book, I think there's a couple left. Right. Uh, there's a, a disc as well yes. which has all my demos of the period because I'm always, I was recording at home yeah with my Revox A77 and eventually a TAC, then all those original songs are there. Mm. And I didn't include those, those ones with Sting singing will appear on a police deluxe album. Yes. Uh, at some point. Uh, 
oh yeah, I've got him singing my hit, my don't care. I've got a, a recording of him singing it. Wow. Oh, the cruelty. The whole period of this time really showed, and, and you, you wrote this in, in the book where you said, uh, curved air had been a breeze, but the police was a hard slog every inch of the way. Even when success found us, we were slogging up the mountain. Absolutely. You know, I, we, we look at a band like the police and we go, wow, look at them. So good. They became so big. And we forget that there was a period where you're eating beans out of a can. Absolutely. And it was during that period that we learned, honed our sound, paid mm -hmm. our dues, got it together, and it took all that work. But even when we started to make it, we drove ourselves. We drove yes. ourselves. We were, we got a, a, a ha you know our fingernails clawing on the mountainside, mm -hmm. climbing up. Uh, whereas in Curved Air, in the old wave, we were assigned to a record company who paid all the bills, and we had a crew – and we'd play the gigs, we'd laugh and giggle, then we'd play our set, burn down the house, because it was actually a pretty good live act yeah. um, with a good following. I joined at the very end of Curve Dare. You know, mm. I was the last rat to jump aboard the sinking ship. <laughs> uh, but it actually was did pretty well, and it was very comfy. It was We had a crew around us and everything. I didn't worry about management. I didn't worry about whether the band even was going to make it or not. Mm. But with the police... I cared about every detail yeah. and it was me on the phone hustling. And then when Andy joined, uh, I had to readjust because Andy also was a very strong hustler. Now we yeah. had two of us and I had somebody to talk to because, you know, Sting was busy at home, yeah. you know, engaged with um, dense literature and songwriting. Uh, and so Andy, it was Andy and I on the phone scheming and choosing shots from the contact sheet and, yeah. you know, uh, uh, so when Andy joined, there were now two of us on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Now this book takes, you know, you write up to the point where you haven't actually gone to America or you just go to America and, and that's kind of your, your, big, your big break moment. Now, I believe that this is a bit of a bookend, I guess the front bookend, to the movie that was released. That's right. Yeah. Well, so, as soon as you got to America... The first disposable income I had, I bought a movie camera. Yeah. And I made the movie, uh, Everyone Stares, which, you know, actually had a, had a, a life of its own. It's out there. Mm. Um, and so this is the period before that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the hungry part. And, and that was the interesting part. Because, like was. I said, it starts to get repetitive after that. You know, one stadium is just like another. I'd love to fast forward to 1984 after Synchronicity Tour. And the band went on hiatus. Did anyone really Melbourne. know? In Melbourne, yes, in Australia. Yeah, we finished up in Melbourne. <clears throat> yeah. You all went your separate ways. Did, I mean, did anyone really know at that point? Did you sit down and have a discussion and go, hey, guys, that's it? Yes, we did. You did. We had decided that we were going to take a sabbatical, a hiatus. We just like... None of us could do anything. I had scored a film for Francis Ford Coppola, mm. and I really liked that work because the police, as you might have heard, mm. was hard environment. Yeah. It was like a Prada suit made out of barbed wire. <laughs> uh, and we drove each other crazy because of our differences and, and so on. We now understand that it was that conflict of musical purpose that made the police what it was. Mm. Um but at the time, it was very difficult. So when I went off to do a film score with Francis Coppola, and I'm all by myself in the studio, no negotiation, no belittlement, no put-downs, no, you know, just free to make music. I'd forgotten, once again, I'd forgotten yeah. how much fun it is to make music when it's not a battle. You don't have to struggle for everything. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to do more of that. Meanwhile, Sting had, had some success with his acting, um, and we just, you know, we want, we, anything that we wanted to do was kind of nipped in the bud, kind yeah. of withered on the vine yeah. because everyone wanted to keep the golden goose producing golden eggs. And nobody thought it was a good idea for anybody of us, any of the three of us to go off and do anything else. Mm -hmm. And we could feel that cage, the golden cage. And we figured, you know, one night we had decided that we were going to finish off. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, after a show in Chicago, we were, and there's talking about, okay, after Australia, then we'll go, we'll do another South American leg, then we'll go back and then maybe do the album, the next album and whatever, whatever. And 
you know, we're going, okay, okay. But we are in the car on the way back to the hotel and Sting and I are talking and we realize, wait a minute, we got to be together on this mm. and we've got to be, you know, we got to make, we'll speak with one voice. Mm. So we get back to the hotel, call Andy and he's in agreement. And we just said, that's it. After, no more after Australia. That's it. Mm. We will have to have what else there after Australia. That's I mean, it. Come on. That's it. That's that's <laughs> the pinnacle of your career. Exactly. Uh, Absolutely. Now, well, that was a good thing about the band is that we did go out yeah. on a high. We never saw the other side of the parabola. Yeah. You know, it, where it starts to go down. We never experienced that. It was still going up like a rocket ship when we walked away. I remember in 1986, you uh, performed um, at the Amnesty concerts and you brought Bono on stage for the final verse of, uh, of Invisible Sun. And at the end, uh, you handed you two the instruments and Bono himself yeah. actually said it was like passing the torch. What a, yeah. great, what a great note to go out on. Well, I mean, our joke was that with Andy was when we Andy when hands his guitar over to Edge, you know, make sure it's out of tune. Uh, <laughs> he, we were kidding; it was a joke. It was a joke. Andy wouldn't have none of us would have done that. We had a <laughs> Never. Lot of respect for you too, Never. and uh, it would be an honor. It was I, I felt honored that that uh, Bono, who was already something, uh, getting would there. see it that way. Yeah, very much so. The there's been a lot of, um, I guess, well documented tension between, I guess, everyone in the band, you know. And we look, we look at this and go, "Oh, all the band's fighting." But was it just a case of that you were all just too close to one another? Uh well, every band is close, and I thought all bands were conflict like that. Um, but I've come across other groups where they get along great <laughs> rush get along great fish get along great the food fighters are the most easy fun hang and show business um the police was not an easy fun hang oh, the Beatles torturous. weren't easy either come on <laughs> uh well we could see that they had some tension too yeah um but we realized the purpose of it and it really was down to the fact that we we figured this out later but music has a different function in our lives. Yeah. And we make it for different reasons. And we make it in different me by different means. Yes. Uh, and for Sting, it's a beautiful thing that he can make that takes him into a place of serenity, beauty, calm, escape from the hurly burly world. It's it's a beautiful place that he goes when he writes songs. Mm. And it's just a wonderful thing. And to bring it to the band and he has a great idea and then he has to negotiate and deal with and compromise and, you know, yeah. that's what was once collaboration is now compromise. And he's got, by now he knows how to write and how to record a hit yes. and he got, gets it perfect in his mind. And when he goes to the band, it's going to be in his mind diminished in some way, yes. diluted by these two. And, and for us, of course, it's going to be diluted. That's what we're in a band for is to take your shit and make something even better out of it. That's, yeah. you know, when we started off and he'd bring a song and cool, cool. And he'd just be happy that we liked the song and the sure, faster, no problem. But by then he really knew what he was doing and it was hard for him. I, I guess, I guess it's the, it's the refining process of a, of a, uh, that's what the band is really there for. And sometimes the fire gets hot. Yeah. It was all about the music and you get burnt over dinner. Yeah. Over dinner, we would get along great. Yeah. And that's always been the case. Even in the reunion tour, mm. we drove each other mad. Yes. Uh, and it was during the reunion tour that we figured out what the deal is, what the formula, what, the, what it's all about. In yeah. fact, we had band therapy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it worked. Yeah. And um, we still had the problem. I mean, he still has to sing his beautiful songs with World War Three going on over his left shoulder. And I'm having my fun playing the sound, burning down the building, but I've, I've got to, okay, every now and then, can I ease it off a little bit and let the guy sing his song for a minute? Yeah. Uh, and uh, But there was that tension all there. But as soon as we're off stage, we're back in the pocket. And to this day, we are very tight. Yeah. Yeah, well, the book is uh, is 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 out. Well, you can go, you can order it, pre-order it now. Uh, there's uh, several different copies. There's, um, I think, five hundred copies of the signature edition and a hundred copies of the ultimate edition. I think there's still some left. 
None of the none of the ultimate. The ultimate. None of the ultimate. Gone. All gone. All gone. Uh, yeah. the, the the middle one where you get the book and you get a poster or something. I'm not quite sure what yeah. you get and you don't get. CD but of the, unreleased the, recordings. Yep. You get the CD of unreleased recordings. That's yeah. what you want. That's what you want. And it's called the Police Diaries. Uh, and uh, if you, I'll put the link to uh, to where you can get it uh, on the uh, the description uh, for the podcast. Uh, I just also want to make a quick brief mention of the uh, the symphony versions that you have uh, put together. Oh, yeah. Uh, I want to bring that to Australia. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's um it's police deranged for orchestra. Yes. Where I took those derangements which was the score of the film that I made where I cut up all the songs and did these wrong versions of them and um, I've been playing with or you know my film composing is where I had an involuntary education in in orchestra and I've been doing these shows commissioned by various entities, the Liverpool Symphony, the, 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 you know, the Dallas Symphony, whatever. And somebody said, well, why don't you throw in some police songs there, throw in some hits? And of course, I said, no, no, no. And then, OK, OK, well, yes. And I used those deranged versions that I did for the film, orchestrated those. And I got three soul singers on the mic. Uh, and that was just a, a, a clinical decision. But wow, when I heard them, it blew my mind. And it's like the police sung by the Supremes with a gigantic orchestra and me banging shit. Uh, is, I would think I was and listening to... And then there's to... another version. The story doesn't end oh, there, okay. folks. And, yeah. And that's not all. <laughs> uh, uh, I really loved uh, Every Breath You Take um, with the... with the, in the Zulu? The, yeah, incredible. Just uh, amazing versions that, that you've put together on that on that album. Yeah, yeah. well, I have, you know, there's two versions of the album. There's the first one, which is the original deranged concept. Yeah. But then my buddy, Ricky Cage, with whom I've won a Grammy yes. both of the last two years, yes. uh, he says, give me that record. He sent me over those stems. Then next thing I know, he's got the Soweto Gospel Choir, the Mazanzi Youth Choir, uh, uh, Sui Jian, a huge Chinese artist, yes. uh, and various others, and he's created a global version of it. Fantastic. And like, like I was saying, every breath you take in Zulu, yeah. is kind of cool. Yeah. And in, in Hindi we have we have you know Urdu, Tamil, Hindi, uh Ar- Armenian. Amazing. It's 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 the that's really alternative. Yeah. 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 Well, y- you finish your book with uh this uh, this line and you say we were still on a mission to make the coolest music and be the coolest band. And I have to say from uh a fan, a police fan there isn't very many bands out there that have stood have stood the test of time and are still to this day uh, on playlists on classic rock and on on adult hits. I mean, sensational well, music. You've dragged it out of me once again. You've forced me. You've forced a brag out. Okay, of me. you just demanded the brag <laughs> that on Spotify we are now uh, ahead of not only you two but Led Zeppelin. Oh. Pink Floyd. Wait a minute. That's just not right. Pink Floyd? Ever heard of wow. Dark Side of the Moon? Wow. Well, we're get we're getting more you know, more streams, more listens than Led Zeppelin. Come on, folks. Have you no taste, no class? <laughs> get out your Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I uh, love it. I love it. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. And uh, look, I, I hope the, uh, the the book goes well. Uh, in my opinion, well, thank you. everybody should have this on their coffee table and uh, be using this yep. as a reference for how to make it in the music industry. Well, there is that. There mm. is some use to the book. Mm. Mm. And uh, just final final thing, what are you listening to right now? I'm listening to Sleaford Mods. I'm listening to Idol. I'm listening right. to, uh, for some reason, Angry Music makes me happy. <laughs> uh, we've come right, all circled all the way back to that punk again. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why is that Slipknot just improves my day? <laughs> why doesn't it? Seriously, everybody needs a bit of Slipknot. Absolutely. Although I did catch it just by accident. I saw Jacob Collier playing a show in Italy, and I'm wow, that little sucker, 28 years old, 
should have been throttled at birth, that kid. Well, they feed kids <laughs> these days He's on a piano, on a guitar stage. I'm stealing chops off this kid. You know, he's a he's a yeah. uh, I'm 70. He's 28. But what's that? He's like a he's less prodigy. than half my age or something. Mm. And uh, dang, that kid's good. You see, when I was driving my kids to school, they would keep me hip. But they've all grown up and out now. And the last I heard was Kendrick Lamar. And I haven't heard about anything <laughs> since then, except for I have to run into Sleaford Mod. They're so tough. That That is the weirdest band in the world. I don't know if they're big in Australia. <laughs> check them out. I will check them out, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Stuart Copeland. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Well, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Long Way to the Top. Hit plus or follow to subscribe to the podcast and head over to Facebook at the Long Way to the Top podcast and give us a like. Keep on rocking and I'll catch you on the next episode of Long Way to the Top.